Okay, we're going to dive right into the text today. John chapter 13, verse 33. Um, we're in a series on the I am statements of Jesus. And he's made a different I am statement every single week, and he reveals a different part of himself to us through that I am statement. Um, the, the last two were really big ones. He healed a man born blind, and when he did, he said he was the, um, says the good shepherd. Um, and then last week, he raised Lazarus from the dead and said he was the resurrection and the life. And so, so many of the things that Jesus does, he'll declare who he is, and then he'll follow it up with his actions. And today, here's where Jesus is at. And I want you to know the context, because this story isn't going to make sense out of its context. The context is, is that they just had the last supper, Jesus and his disciples. Do you remember that? When they're in the upper room and they do the bread and they, they do the wine and, and Jesus tells them he's about to go to the cross and he washes their feet to show his humility and to show service in the kingdom of God. And it's the last supper because he's about to die. And the way the text goes in John is they leave the upper room where the last supper took place. And they take this walk, and the walk lasts two chapters all by itself. We're not reading them all today. It's okay. But at the end of that walk, he's going to end up in Gethsemane, and he's going to be arrested and taken to the cross. So in these two weeks are our last two I am statements. Today is I am the way, the truth, and the life. Next week is going to be I am the vine. Come back next week, and we'll talk about being in the vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the context for this is John 13, 33. And he said this to them. He said, dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. Now he's talking to the 12 disciples and they know Jesus. They've walked with him for three years and gotten to know him, gotten to know his ministry. Like he's everything to them. How do you think they reacted to this statement that he's about to leave them? Sad right? Sad, like heartbroken. Where, where are you going to go? And how are we going to make it? How are we going to live? And he says, you can't follow me where I'm going. And then in chapter 14, verse one, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be sad. Don't, don't be overwhelmed. And this isn't Jesus just trying to tell them how to feel, by the way. Sometimes people have come along to you and they have told you just like, stop feeling that feeling. Just feel a different feeling, would you? And how helpful is that? Zero percent? It just doesn't help. You can't just tell me what not to feel. You've got to give me a new feeling to have. You've got to give me an action step to take. And so Jesus does. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. He's saying, no, I need you to trust right now because it's going to get tough. There is more than enough room, he says, in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Now that's good news. Is he says, I'm about to go home. What does that mean? He's about to go to heaven to be with the father when he dies on the cross. And then he's gonna rise again and then he's going to ascend into heaven permanently, yes? Until he comes back again in the second coming for us. And so all of that stuff, all those historical moments are kind of in view here for Jesus. But he's like, yeah, I'm going to go die. I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to ascend into heaven. And then I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. You're going to wonder in a few years where I'm at. That's where I am. I'm preparing a place for you because there's room back home for you in my father's house. Some of you grew up with translations that said, um, there are many mansions in my father, father's house and you get your own mansion. Um, that's a real fun memory, but that's not accurate in the Greek. I'll just tell you that. Um, we get spaces and, and the Greek definitely indicates that there are many spaces. There is a lot of space there, but there's nothing about glittery mansions with a pool in the back. Now, maybe you get your own pool. I'm not saying you don't. I'm just saying the text doesn't say it. So we'll move on from that. But he's going to prepare a place for you. Who prepares a place for somebody? Think about parents with little babies. Before the baby's born and you're pregnant, you prepare that nursery, don't you? You prepare everything in the house. Why? Because love prepares a welcome. Yes. Uh, my youngest daughter, Gracie, got home from college this, this week for the summer. We went and picked her up on, on Friday from OSU. And, and do you know how hard Linda was working in her room? 
to make sure her bed was ready. And special foods were bought at the grocery store because Gracie was coming home. Love prepares a welcome. That's, that's an impulse that Jesus is saying. It's not only in good moms, by the way, it's in Jesus. He's preparing a welcome for us and that's good news and it shows his heart. And then he says, and then I'm gonna come back and get you. Love that. And that's taught all over the New Testament. The, the moment when Jesus comes, right, with the, the voice of the archangel, right, the trumpet, and Jesus comes and he gets us that where I am, you may also be forever. And so we will always be with the Lord together with him. And, and all of a sudden it kind of comes full circle. It began in Bethlehem, right, with the baby being born at Christmas, whose name was, if you were paying attention, Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us because the deepest heart of God is to always be with his people and not be separated from you, amen? amen. And so Jesus looks forward to the day when we will all be with him. Now here comes Thomas, verse four. Jesus says to them, and you know the way that I'm going. He means to home. Honest Thomas says, no, we don't, Lord. You gotta love Thomas. We have no idea where you're going, Jesus. So how can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Uh, Thomas gets a bad rap in church history, yes. Uh, we call him Doubting Thomas a lot. And it's because after the, uh, the resurrection, Thomas is the one that says, I won't believe in Jesus that he's been raised from the dead until I can see his hands, see the nail holes in the hands and actually put my fingers in the nail holes, right? Some people would call that a chain of evidence. I wanna see the guy that was killed come back to life in front of me. And if I can see that chain of evidence right here, then I'll believe. And so we call him Doubting Thomas for it. I don't think that's fair. I think Thomas asks the questions we all want to ask. I think the other disciples in the room were really glad he said it because they were all feeling it. Yeah. Um, some people have come to you uh, down through time and have said things to you like, um, your questions and doubts are wrong. You shouldn't have questions and doubts. Um, it's not the antithesis of faith, guys. Questions and doubts are often the road that we take to faith. So ask your questions and have your doubts. Just don't sit on them. Take them to the Lord, amen? Yeah. Honest Thomas. And then I'm gonna take us back to that verse six that we just read there. And we're gonna, we're gonna pull that into greater focus. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Mm. The promise that Jesus is the way home. That's what he's saying. I am the way home. The way home is not a road. It's not a geographical location. The way home is me, he says. The way home is a relationship with me. It's a connection to me. And we're going to explore what that means, that the way forward, the way home is Jesus. How do we get home? The answer is Jesus is the way that you get home. And he says that, and that's so comforting to us as Christians. And there's some of the most beautiful words ever spoken, that he's the way home. But then you get to the phrase at the very end, except through me, mm, it's hard. Isn't that hard? Except through me. Oh, Jesus, you just made it exclusive. Hold, wait, you're saying there's no other way? Just you. No, just me. There's, there's no acrobatics you can do with the Greek to make that go away. Except through me, I'm the only way, he says. And that's tough. It's tough in our culture, isn't it? In our culture, the unforgivable sin is intolerance. You must tolerate every system, every faith, every religion, every teaching. And you must acknowledge that they all eventually find their ways to the one true God and to heaven, or you're a bigot, you're conceited, and you're wrong. Let's call it out. Let's say what it is. Yeah. Say it not because we don't care. We do care. 
We love the people in this culture. Even if you're not in that place anymore, there was a, there was a time when those thoughts made sense to you. I don't, I'm not being flippant, but face what Jesus just said there, except through me. Because he didn't make it easy on us. And I want to tell you, those are ancient words. Um, there's a part of you that's like, Jesus, shouldn't you have edited those knowing where culture was going to head 2,000 years later? What I would tell you is that he knows the future. And when he spoke those ancient words to us, he knew the day he knew the context that we would be hearing them in, and yet he said them anyway. I'm not trying to frustrate anybody here, not intentionally, but I want you to face what's true because he said it. There's, gosh, he claimed to be the total exclusive pathway home. How dare he? This is a moment uh, that philosophers, specifically Christian philosophers, that they say we get caught in this trilemma. And I know that's a fancy word. Today, by the way, you're going to have to love the Lord your God with your mind today. I'm going to need your brains today. Um, they call it the trilemma. Lord, lunatic, or liar. A lot of times what we want to do is we want to choose Jesus Christ. Please hear me. We want to choose Jesus Christ because he's a good moral teacher. He gave us the golden rule. He taught wonderful things about forgiveness. We see mercy in his actions. There's so much about Christ that we find attractive and good. And so we want Jesus, but we don't want everything Jesus has said. And what's difficult is that when he's the person that comes in and says, I'm the only way, he just became a package deal. Jesus, you just made this hard. Because how do I accept you as a good moral teacher and not accept your absolute claim to exclusive salvation? You can't. Either he was right or he's a liar or he's lost his mind. And if he's lost his mind or he's a liar, he can't be a good moral teacher. It doesn't fit. Do you see how he just trapped you there? He intended to. Oh, the room's quiet. Um, I'm going to spend some time really trying to go into this because this whole area of exclusivity and intolerance, it's what I would call a grown-up question. And I believe it demands a grown-up answer. There's not an easy Bible verse that I'm going to throw at you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to what the New Testament says to answer this very difficult question. And so I need your grown-up brains. The world values tolerance above all. And I'd say first and foremost, that demand is irrational. And it's inconsistent in our culture. We don't apply that demand for intolerance or for tolerance. We don't demand that, that value of tolerance across the board. For instance, when you were in grade school math and you did a math problem, were there 20 possible answers to the math problem? No, there was only one right answer because it's what we expect from mathematicians. We expect absolute black and white accuracy. My wife and I have been watching this uh, TV show the last year, and it's about astronauts. And it's been super fun. And, and um, they're always trying to like go to the moon and then go to Mars. And, and they're showing like the control room and all the different things that they're doing. And in the midst of it, you just hear things. Everything is saturated with these brilliant minds who are saying the speed has got to be exactly this. And the angle of the ship has got to be exactly this. And their position has got to be exactly this. Because if all these things are not exact, everybody's going to die. Everybody's going to, and that's always their answer. If everything isn't exact, everybody's going to die. And you know, it's true. And so you want those people at the steering wheel. Yes. Because they're going to get you there. And you want the same thing from your medical doctor, by the way. You don't want a wishy-washy medical doctor. You're going to go out and Google and find a different one if that's the way that they are. 
right? Because when it comes to scientists and mathematicians and astronauts and medical doctors, we want absolute intolerance. We want black and white truth from them. That's what we expect. So who came along and decided that when it comes to saving people, that somehow all of a sudden we have to be tolerant? Who decided that? That's absolutely inconsistent and irrational. So that's my challenge. Um, And also, if Jesus is is the only way, if he truly is, if that's the truth, don't you want to know it? Dr. Strange. Uh Uh-huh. You're welcome. Um, Okay, so this is uh, Endgame is the movie that this is in. And they're fighting a bad guy. Surprise, surprise. Uh, His name's Thanos, and they're not sure how they're going to beat Thanos. And it comes to this moment, and Dr. Strange, you're going to be quizzed on this later, so listen very carefully. Um, He's got this thing called a time stone, and he can, like, project himself forward into time, and he can see different timelines based on people's different um, decisions and actions and things like that. And so he gets this idea. He's like, I'm going to go and look at every single possible sequence, different sequence and combination of actions, and see which one of them gets us winning against Thanos. And he looks at hundreds of thousands of possible combinations and he comes back and says, there's only one. There's only one where he's defeated and we win. And that's tough. You're like, man, I would have expected a hundred comeback, right? But if it's only one, don't you want to know it? If that's the truth, then don't we actually want Jesus to say it? It's not bigoted if it's true. And it's true. So why is it true? Why is Jesus the only way? He's the only way home because getting to heaven is not the only thing. It's not about getting to a location. It's about getting whole. It's about getting home and getting whole, both. For example, if you know the story of the prodigal son, we all love the moment when the prodigal son runs up the road and he's ready to be forgiven by the father and the father hugs him and says, let's throw a party. We love the forgiveness in that story. But do you know what the prodigal son had to do first? He had to leave the pig pen behind. He had to first stop and look at the life that he had made as broken as it was. And he had to repent of it. He had to abandon it. He had to surrender his new life back to the father. You don't get the new home and the pig pen at the same time. That's what many of us want to do. Zacchaeus was the exact same way, if you know the story. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. Some of you grew up in Sunday school, sang that song. I'm not going to sing it for you, though. I love you too much. I love you too much. (sighs) Michael will do it though. I love it. Anyway, uh, the real story though, it's a dark one actually. He was a tax collector. And in those days, people who collected taxes for the Romans were betraying their people. They were making an already poor Jewish people more poor. They weren't just collecting the taxes necessary. They were embellishing the numbers. It was extortion it was lying. It was stealing. They, 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 were, they were considered the bad guys. And so Jesus took this bad guy and said, I'm going to come to your house for dinner. And Jesus came and honored Zacchaeus and came into his world. And it gets to the end. I hope that was thunder. Wow. <laughs> it is Fort Sill. Um, Jesus goes to his house. And there's this moment where Zacchaeus comes to Jesus and says, If I have robbed anybody or cheated anybody out of any money, I will pay it back and a whole lot more. And Jesus' response to him is, today salvation has come to this house. Why? Is it because Zacchaeus, by his good action, earned his way to heaven? No, because you never can. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not by works so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. The reason Jesus said today salvation has come to this house is because he saw that he had turned from his own old life. He left his pig pen. 
He's like, Jesus, I'll surrender to you. And that's the pathway to becoming whole and going home. It's both. Jesus does not hand out easy tickets to heaven. Jesus makes us whole. Remember that. Many of us, we want an easy ticket to heaven, and that's <laughs> not it. He says he's the way, the truth, the life. Amen. Do those the statements bother you? They bother me. No, I, I want you to be one of many ways. I want you to be one way. I want you to be my truth or your truth, but not the truth. I want to have my own life, not it be the life, i.e. your life that I've got to live through you. But Jesus is absolute with us. Every single one of those statements is a statement of surrender. No, you will leave the pig pen. That's the only way home. He's the only way home. Um, another illustration, Wally. Here you go. For you non-Marvel people, you Pixar people. <laughs> Wally imagines a place in the future where um, Earth has become uninhabitable. And people have basically escaped on these spaceship cruise liners, essentially. And that's how they're living. And they kind of forget that they want to go back to Earth. Um, it's a funny little story. And you kind of see them and everybody's got their own little uh, hover chair scooter thing. Everybody's got their own virtual screen right in front of their eyes. I love how they put it right in front of their eyes because nobody does that ever. <laughs> and they've all got their own slushy there and probably Taco Tuesdays every Tuesday. All of that, right? And they've got all of those things. Here's the question. If you go to heaven someday, does God owe you that? Does God owe you a scooter and a slushie and Taco Tuesdays and a screen right in front of your eyes? Does God owe you that? Now, you know the right Sunday school answer to give me, but don't we sometimes treat him like he does? Because see, even if he were to give that to you, the problem is, is that you would still be there in all your brokenness. You would still be there in your paranoia, in your people-pleasing, in your narcissism, in your greed, in your lust, in your anger, in your inability to work on the past, in your inability to forgive anybody around you, all that bitterness, all that junk, it would go to the scooter with you. That's right. And you'd be stuck with you. Your current misery level would just be shifted into a heavenly scooter. That's not salvation. Salvation is whole and home. Why do I have to surrender to Jesus and to his way? Because I don't want to trap you in a scooter with your own misery for all of eternity. Because that's how good he is. He wants you to surrender and leave your misery behind. And you got work to do. His work through you. Your work is surrender. Your, your work is, yes, Jesus, you can come in. Hallelujah. That's your work. Also, it's essential that you leave your selfishness behind. Because, man, those scooters were too close to each other. Right? Like, if, if we all just shifted there, gosh, how much cruelty and violence and selfishness and how much would we be hurting each other? Like, Yes? Like, this is the world we live in. If we just took us and put us up there, I mean, you'd need a solid 20 feet between each scooter or at least put some kind of bubble of protection around you so that nobody else gets hurt. Or maybe here's what we do. We just put you in your own room and we lock the door and you can have Taco Tuesday by yourself so that nobody else gets hurt. And then when you got your screen We'll hire Mark Zuckerberg to police your social media feed so you can't police or hurt anybody else online. And all of a sudden, I'm not describing heaven anymore. It's hell, right? Like we, have to, we have to surrender us in order to get there. We need our hearts whole. Um, we see this with rehab facilities. Here's another example. You've heard of this before. The best rehab facilities, what, what happens is the very first step. They ask the person 
to check themselves in, right? Nobody arrests them and drags them kicking and screaming into the rehab facility. The person who needs to be healed and needs to do the work has got to take the first step on their own proactively. They have to check themselves in. Why? Because they appreciate that the first step of healing is surrender. Amen. And it's surrender all along the way. Nobody can make you be healed. You've got to let the healing in. Yes. And Jesus is no different. Okay, here's, here's some more verses. More verses coming at you. Um, why is Jesus the only way? Ultimately, because God says so. In this slide, I just want you to know that this is not one random verse where it makes it look like Jesus is the only way to God. I want you to see the other verses so that you know that you're cornered and you can't get out of it. This is what your Bible says. John 10, 9, Jesus says he's the only way in. And we looked at this two weeks ago. Jesus said, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pasture. And if you remember, it was like the sheepfold. It was like the circle wall. And there was only one opening. And Jesus said he laid himself in the opening to protect us and to sacrifice himself for us over my dead body. But there was only one way in and it was through him. See, we were talking about exclusivity two weeks ago. We just didn't deep dive into it. So today we're doing it. The next verse, 2 Timothy 2, 5, for there's one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Jesus Christ. That verse says we're broken with God. Because of our sins, there's a brokenness between us and him. And only Jesus can put it back together again. Third, Acts 4, 12 there is salvation in no one else. These are the words of the apostle Peter in a sermon he gave in Acts 4. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. There's no wiggling out of it. And why do we reject his way? Here comes John chapter 3, verse 18. Now this passage is a, is a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. It's a long conversation. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son comes out of that conversation. Two verses later, Jesus says these words, super important. He says, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in Jesus, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. Now pause right there. What are they judged for? Are they judged for their sins? No. Because their sins have been paid for on the cross. I know this is theology, but you can do it. What they're judged for at the judgment, when you stand before God, is one question. What did you do with Jesus? Did you believe in Jesus Christ or not? Did you surrender to him or not? He makes it clear right there. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. The judgment will be, what did you do with Jesus? But what keeps you back from surrendering to him is you don't want to give up your sins. That's why if I let Jesus in the house and he wants to clean things up and sweep things up, I know what he's going to find. Come on, ask yourself just for a second, what's he gonna find? Because you know, and you don't want him going there. Neither do I, by the way. It's tough, surrender's tough. And yeah, he's gonna see this thing and he's gonna know about this now. And he's gonna walk up to me and he's gonna ask me to surrender and let go of this. Yeah, he will. That's part of becoming whole. But we don't want to. We don't want to give up control of our life or our version of the pursuit of happiness. He will demand that his pursuit of happiness through you trumps your pursuit of happiness. Luke 16, 29, it gets even harder. Luke 16, 29, but Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. Now, just real quick, let me give you some context to this one. And I know this is a lot. We're jumping around a lot. This is a parable that Jesus told. It's called Lazarus and the rich man. Not the Lazarus from last week. It's a different Lazarus. Lazarus and the rich man. And he imagines the rich man has lived his own life in his own way. And then he has died and he has gone to hell or Gehenna. 
and he starts speaking to Abraham. And while he's there, he's like, you know what? God has not reached out to my brothers who are still alive enough. I would like some miracles for them. I would like some supernatural things for them so that they would repent. If only they could have some more moments with Jesus, then they would repent. And he asks Abraham this question. And Abraham says, Moses and the prophets have already warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. Verse 30, the rich man replied, no, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Can you see the layers there? And Jesus is saying, I'm about to rise from the dead, and they're not going to believe in me either. Even with all of his miracles right in front of their eyes. You see what he's saying there? And this is hard, hard truth, guys. Many of us want to come and say, God, you haven't shown me enough. He say, it's, it's not about can't here. It's about won't here. It's about won't surrender. It's tough. So should we do some good news? Let's do some good news. Um, God is reaching toward us. Even though the scripture and the coming of Jesus is all that we need, God still is reaching toward us in his grace, in his mercy. Um, This scripture is just about to blow you away. The very first way that God reaches out to us is the credibility of creation. Look at this verse, Romans 1, 19. They know the truth about God because he made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Blunt. He said, God intentionally built the seasons. He intentionally built the laws of physics. He intentionally wove order into everything and beauty into everything and variety and color and music into everything. Why? So you would know that there was a great designer behind it all. He proved himself in the Psalms that says, the heavens declare the glory of God. And the atmosphere shows his handiwork. Day to day, it utters speech. Night to night, it shows knowledge. There's no speech nor language where his, I'm going King James now, where his voice is not heard. His light has gone out to all the earth. See, we've all been told. The preaching has already happened. See, it's not Billy Graham in an amphitheater, even though that's wonderful. What God is saying is I've been preaching to humanity from day one. I wove it into creation that they could not deny me, even though many have suppressed their knowledge of God. Read Romans 1. It's a fascinating read. Next is the moral law that's in their hearts, Romans 2.14. And he says, even Gentiles, and by that what he means is people who didn't grow up in church people who haven't been exposed to the Old Testament, to the truth. He says, even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them that they are doing right. What is he talking about here? He's saying every single person, even if there's some like, like, foreign country, like in a hut somewhere and never saw the Bible before. He's like, they have a law written in their hearts. Basic things. Like it's better to tell a truth than the lie. We all know it. No one had to take us to Sunday school and teach us that one. We all know it. We all know that courage is better than cowardice in a fight. We all know that violence is wrong unless it's in self-defense. We just know it because as soon as we see that injustice, we know what injustice is regardless of our upbringing. We know it. We know it's best to keep a promise even though we don't always. I could go on and on. Studies have been done. They've looked at 60 plus cultures and they've seen the unified moral law that weaves down through all of humanity, regardless of the culture that you're talking about. 
And what do we know? We know there's a law and we know we don't keep it. And that tells us pretty much all that we need to know. So somebody who's never even been to church before has enough data to say, God, I'm a broken person and I need you. You're the one who created the world. I know there's a right and wrong and I know I'm not measuring up. I need you. All we need are the first two calls of God. That's it. And everybody gets them. So here comes the third, the life of Jesus. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. He has revealed God to us. As soon as Jesus came, you want to talk about preaching, God preached through the life of his Son. God sent Jesus and blew the minds of humanity for all time. Because when we saw Jesus and we saw what he did, we saw his compassion, we saw his mercy, the woman caught in adultery and here's her accusers who want to execute her and Jesus gets in the way of them and says the one without sin gets to cast the first stone and he protects her even though she was guilty, blew our minds. Of course we love him. The coming of Jesus Christ has preached into the world and then you got the fourth one. This is the church's preaching. Romans 10, 14, but how can they call on Jesus to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? What he's saying is, it is the church's job to pay it forward. Amen. If the gospel of Jesus Christ has saved us, we need to go and speak it to other people. And, and again, Billy Graham in an amphitheater is great. And even me up here in front of you preaching, that's great. But it means so much more than that. The primary thing that that probably means that passage is one individual Christian sharing their life with you. And what I know from talking to enough of you is that most of you in this room, the only reason that you're here today is because somebody influenced you to go to God. Somebody, some aunt, some grandma, some mother, some sister, some person in your life, man, they bugged you long enough. They showed you some love. They showed you the character and the way of Jesus just through their actions. Maybe they even did a really bad job of it. Maybe you came in spite of them. But that's our job as Christians is to make sure enough people know about Jesus so that they can make a decision. See, here's the thing. All these callings, they're more than enough. But in God's grace and his love for humanity, he just keeps calling, amen? So here's the next one that the scripture talks about, Acts 17. This is Paul talking on Mars Hill. It's in Athens. And this is part of his uh, speech that he makes. He says, and God made from one man, he means Adam there, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Now pause real quick right there. He's saying, God chose for every single human soul down through human history, exactly when you would be born. That's allotted times. And exactly where you would be born and into what family? Because he, he looked at you and he said, you need to be with these parents or with this coach or with this teacher or in this community or in this church family or whatever it is, I need to put you here. Why? Verse 27, so that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. God destined your birth so that you could find him. Yes. And then the last one is supernatural intervention. Acts 17. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment, and he was a devout, God-fearing man. And one afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. That'd freak you out, right? 
Cornelius, the angel said, and then the story goes on, and Cornelius and his whole household is saved because of a supernatural intervention of God. Paul, Saul, on the Damascus road, and Jesus comes and shines a light at him and blinds him, actually, and saves him on the spot. Do you remember that story? You got the Ethiopian eunuch that's like driving along and trying to study the book of Isaiah and can't figure it out. And so the Holy Spirit literally teleports Philip, the evangelist, right next to his chariot. Supernatural intervention. God looked at everything for this particular soul and said, this one gets a miracle because they need it. How do those decisions get made? I don't know. Don't, isn't there a part of us that would like to give every single human soul their own miracle like that? Of course, I feel that. But hear Jesus' words in his parable to the rich man. It's not about can't, it's about won't. Many saw the miracles of Jesus and still didn't respond to him. They tried to kill him instead. So here's a summary slide, just real quick for you. If you've been taking notes and trying to get those verses there, this is a tool for you to be able to try to answer this question. You might even want to take this into your Bible study or your home group um, and just work through those verses together and talk about the way that God calls us so much more than what we think. Also, that... That slide is going to be inserted into the chat online um, in case you need that. Okay, here's where I'm going to kind of end. I'm going to talk to you about missionaries here for a second. This is a little bit more about supernatural intervention that God does. Uh, several years ago, so, some missionaries who were, um, they're trying to take the message of Jesus into places where Christianity was not what, where, what people grew up with, Okay. And they're trying to take the message there and they're seeing people choose Jesus when they preach the message. And certain ones, they started asking the question, what are the reasons why people are choosing Jesus when they didn't grow up with this? And I'll be honest with you, a couple weeks ago, I was here at church and I was out in the lobby and I got into a conversation with a brother who goes to this church. And he said, someone had come and asked him the question, do you only believe in Christianity because you grew up with it and that's what your parents taught you? And anybody else who grew up with something else, do they only believe that? Is it just that simple, that clear cut? And he and I were just discussing how you answered that question. I think this missionary stuff is part of what helps me. So these missionaries studied people who had chosen Jesus over time, and there's a lot that I'm going to skip for time, but I'll tell you about one study that was done by a guy named J. Dudley Woodbury. That's quite a name, yes? Um, he was a well-known missionary. He did this in 2007. And he studied uh, conversions between 1991 and 2007 across 30 different countries, and he asked them their top reasons for choosing Jesus when they didn't know Jesus before. And here were their answers they said it was the lifestyle of the Christians around them who reached out to them. Amen. They said it was the power of God was the second answer in answered prayers and healing. So there's a supernatural element. Said the spiritual truth that they saw in the scripture. And some of them have even pointed to the scripture that was translated into their particular language really ministered to them. They said the life and teaching of Jesus and then their last answer kind of really baffled them. They said supernatural dreams. Wow. Dreams. A different study done by a magazine called Mission Frontiers. They looked at 600 people who had chosen Jesus, not from Christian areas. And they concluded that 25% of those people who had come to Jesus had experienced a supernatural dream. Wow. What's God doing? Here's one example that was written down from one of these folks. This was an elderly Afghan woman, was a refugee in a refugee camp. She had gone to Athens. Um, none of her family had come with her. She was all alone. And each week she would go to this particular uh, Christian ministry center for help. 
She wasn't interested in Jesus, but she was interested in the, the help that they could give her. She was overwhelmed. And there was a Persian pastor that was stationed there. And he, he said he had prayed with her many times and explained that the secret to all of her troubles was King Jesus, was surrendering to King Jesus. But she said later that she just would literally laugh at him. Uh, she was not interested. And he told her this. He said, if God reveals himself to you and shows you the truth, will you follow him? And two weeks later, it was during the day, um, she walked by that same ministry and the door was closed. Nobody was there and it was locked. And so she just sat down on the porch in front of that door to wait for somebody to come back so she could get the help that she needed. And as she sat down in front of that locked door, suddenly a bright light started shining from behind her. In front of her, she saw a gigantic shadow cast in front of her from the light. She started to shield her eyes. It was so bright. And then she heard a voice, and she said the voice spoke in her own language, which I think personally for me is the most important part of the story. Spoke in her own language, said, my daughter, my daughter, the door is open for you. Come. And she replied, the door is closed, meaning the physical door behind her, not getting the spiritual aspect of what was just said. So again, the voice called to her, I am the son of God, Jesus. The door is open for you, my daughter. I am the door. Amen. She told the pastor later, many times you, pastor, have encouraged me to pray that God would speak to me. I thought it was blasphemy, but now I know that Jesus is alive. One of, the, uh, one of the pastors and missionaries was quoted as saying, we've got to like stop and tell people, don't sit around and wait for a dream. Don't sit around and wait for a, a vision. Read the word. Talk about your faith. Talk about your questions. But man, when the dreams come, praise God. Amen. Praise God. Would you guys stand? I'm going to read one last verse to you. Romans 2.15. And I know you're shifting around, but please take these words in their life-changing words. We read part of this earlier. It says, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So I want you to imagine it. A moment will come where you will stand before God. And the question will not be about your sin. It will be about what did you do with Jesus? Did you surrender to him to make you whole and to bring you home? And when you are judged there, he says he'll judge the secrets. He'll see right into your secret thoughts and motives and every memory of your, your whole existence. And what's he looking for as he searches through your secrets? I don't believe he's looking for your sin. I think he's saying things like, on this day, at this time, this person told you the truth. In this moment, I saw into your heart and you knew what was right, but you chose against it for your own reasons. He will judge the secrets of each man's heart. It's a powerful verse. It's a very confrontational verse. Happy Mother's Day. You go down through that list, how many of those ways has God called out to you? And how many ways has he been clear to you? And if I could just say it, today, this message has been a calling out to you. Yes. So I'm gonna lead us in a prayer and you'll have an opportunity to change your entire eternity to surrender your life to God. And I don't need your marketing information at the end. I don't need money from you at the end. I don't need anything from you at the end. It's between you and almighty God. Amen. And Jesus has come to save you and you have an opportunity to surrender maybe for the very first time. 
So I'm gonna walk us through a prayer together. And like I said earlier, I would love for you to get baptized next week. I would love for you to get a Bible at the back. I would love for you to do all of those things. Let's fill up that tank next week. And I'm gonna walk us through a prayer. I'll just say this to you too quickly um, as Christians. If you're Christians here and you're like, I've already surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, uh, let, me, let me just stretch that illustration just really quick. Maybe you've let him in the front door, but how many locked rooms are in your house? Jesus, I let you in a long time ago, but I've got some closets over here I've never let you into. And Christian, if surrendering is the way that you get whole by his power, in his way, in his time, it's not just about letting him in the front door. You've got to surrender all of it. Amen. And if you're honest here today, you might be doing some surrendering too. Because God, I don't have wholeness in these areas in my life and I want wholeness. So I surrender them. So we're going to pray this prayer together. If you would bow your heads, close your eyes. And these are not magic words. What's powerful is if you speak them to God Almighty. And I'll just give you some phrases to guide you and he can hear your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. You have my days. You have my eternity. Come and save me. Make me whole. Forgive my past. Thank you for dying for me. Set me on a new road. Fill up my life with you. Thank you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.